future career path. So I'm going to start with this really, really busy slide. Um, it's covering over 20 years of my career, but um, I wanted to share this because I think there are, there are many components in this slide that, that I wanted to share uh, that can be kind of a great lesson in terms of you know, your research career path, as well as you know, securing your mentors. And also in terms of how you progress from one stage to the next. So as a full background, you know, I'm Korean, but my family moved to Thailand when I was a kid. I was 10 years old when my family moved to Thailand. I grew up in Thailand, you know, went to an international school and, and, and then came to the US for college. So I went to Tufts University in, 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 uh, in the East Coast in Medford, Massachusetts. And, um, you know, I think many, many Koreans and many, you know, like my, my initial goal was to go into med school. So junior year, I went to, you know, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and I did an internship, physician shadowing. And, you know, that summer was a really eye-opening experience. Um, I saw a lot of, um, and it was in the cancer unit. So I saw a lot of, you know, areas and aspects of, you know, how, what, it be, what it means to become a physician that I never really saw firsthand. And I realized, um, you know, being honest and being really frank with myself, I realized that that's really not the ideal path for me. And, you know, but I still wanted to be involved in public health. So, you know, Yale University was like a few hours away in Connecticut. So I was like, okay. So after junior year, I took the GRE and I was like, okay, whatever. I'll just apply to public health. So, so I got into Yale, you know, School of Public Health, um, uh, MPH degree, concentrating in global health. And after my first year, I had this opportunity to have an internship in uh, Northeastern Thailand with this community uh, non-governmental organization called Population and Community Development Association. And I would say that was like the very first time uh, where I realized, you know, the burgeoning epidemic that was going on in the 80s when I was growing up in Thailand and I had no clue. Like, so I was, you know, going to international school, raised in Bangkok. I had no idea that there was a you know, epidemic, you know, starting in the late 80s in Thailand. And it was such a critical experience for me to, you know, work with, you know, a lot of wives in the Northeastern Thailand in these villages who contract, you know, HIV from their husbands when the husbands go to the city during the non-rice harvesting season uh, to get an extra income. And then, you know, they contract HIV from the city they come back and then they infect their wives. And it was, it was an eye-opening experience and I wanted to you know, pursue my career in public health, in epidemiology and focus on HIV. Um, and at that time, Yale University, uh, MPH had the center grant called CIRA. It's a Center for Interdisciplinary Research and AIDS. And we have a complementary center grant uh, at UCLA called CHIPS and I'll get into that um, uh, soon. But, you know, CIRA at that time was um, led by this uh, colleague uh, who was the Dean of Public Health at the time, Mike Merson. So, you know, before I moved to UCLA, I, you know, I met with Mike Merson and I, I told him I wanted to, you know, continue on at Yale. Unfortunately, I was an international student at the time. Um, you know, CIRA and CHIPS are federally funded. So the funding the requirement is that you have to be a permanent resident. Uh, and not an international student. So unfortunately, there wasn't really earmarked funding for me to stay at Yale. Uh, at the same time, I wanted to work on HIV and I realized that, you know, Roger Deedles is a world-renowned scholar in HIV. And he, at the time, was uh, doing a lot of uh, forward training program in Southeast Asia. So I wanted to work with him. So came to UCLA uh, in 1998. So that was like over 20 years ago. So, so, you know, the way I got into public health and especially HIV, it was sort of, you know, not really intentional, but I was open to opportunities. And, you know, I wanted to do an internship in Thailand because I grew up there. And it was, it was a really, um, you know, eye-opening experience. And that led me to where I am today. And in terms of mentors, you know, I wanted to share, I think it's important to share like how my career began. So I mentioned CHIPS, 
and it's a center, it's an NIMH funded center grant. And every year, so it's called Center for HIV Identification, Prevention and Treatment Services. And every year they host this um, HIV Next Generation Conference where they provide opportunities for you know, graduate students and young, young investigators to present their work. Uh, Roger was my advisor and he said, oh yeah, you should present your work you did during your summer internship at Yale. So I submitted my abstract, I got accepted to present an oral uh, at the Next Gen Conference. Um, and uh, lo and behold, Mike Merson from Yale was the keynote speaker at that time, that, that specific year. So after my presentation, you know, I went up to Mike and Mike was talking to Mary Jane Rothram Boris, who was the center director of uh, Center, for H center for Community Health. And um, I went up to say hi to him. And then Mike says, oh yeah, Jay, this is uh, one of my students from Yale. He was one of the best students I've had and he's such a great guy. And you know, the work that he did in Thailand is really great. So, and, and Mary Jane, Mary Jane was um, at that time collaborating with Roger on uh, NIH funded popular opinion leader project in China. So Roger goes, oh yeah, Jay, he's one of my doctoral students, so he's great. So Mary Jane says, oh, that's great. I have a job for you. Come to my center and uh, you know, we'll have an opportunity for you. And, and you know, I say this because you know, I've met Mike during my career at Yale like four times tops, but he was such a supporting, he was so generous in terms of um, giving kind words during that interchange, inter, you know, exchange between Roger uh, Mary Jane and, and Mike. And that led me to, you know, go to Mary Jane Center. And, uh, you know, to be honest, I think I don't really have much experience going on interviews because the interview went like this. I went into Mary Jane Center and the biostat person who was doing the data management, uh, Martha B, she says, Dr. Rotherham says, I need to hire you. So that was the start of my uh, interview. And I, you know, I went all prepared, but it looked like there was already a position for me. So I got hired as a staff research associate back in 1999 during my first year doing getting my degree in epidemiology. And I stayed at Center for Community Health until March of this year. So it was like over 20 years of my research career at the same center. So I, I bring this up because I think in terms of how you forge relationships and how you secure mentors, uh, I think it's important to not take um, you know, opportunities for granted. And it's important to reach out to you know, mentors that you think will be a great, great match for you. And I would say mentors in general, they're very generous and they're very giving. And, you know, I, and I, I want to say that uh, because, you know, my career wouldn't have happened if Mike wasn't there to say some kind words. Uh, he didn't have to, he hardly knew me. I spoke to him like a few times when I was at Yale, but he gave such a glowing remark to, to Mary Jane and Mary Jane wanted to hire me. And then, and then my advisor, Roger's like, oh yeah, he's one of my students. He was like boasting, he is one of my students, he's great. So, so that's how I got into a research career. And I think it was really great when I was getting my degree in epidemiology to have the opportunity to engage in hands-on research projects. So, you know, implementing projects as a doctoral student being involved in you know, all aspects of research, whether it's like, you know, IRB submission, questionnaire development, data cleaning. So those are experiences that, that kind of shape uh, who I am. And then after I got my degree uh, in 2003, um, I got a full-time researcher position at the same center and, you know, got involved in a bunch of other uh, research projects. And, and I think relationship is really important. And during my career, getting my doctorate degree in, in epidemiology, I got to meet a lot of foray scholars from Thailand. And they, after they graduated, they became leaders in the Ministry of Public Health in Thailand. And they were uh, key collaborators in uh, future research projects that we had in 2005, uh, family intervention trial in Northern and Northeastern Thailand. I was able to get my career development award uh, by doing collaborating with my partners in Thailand. So, you know, 
kind of fast forwarding, um, you know, from a researcher position, I was able to get advanced to assistant professor in residence uh, in the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, and that's uh, back in 2010. And, you know, um, Jeff mentioned that I have a joint appointment in epidemiology. So in terms of, you know, how you advance from assistant to associate to full professor, there are key components. Uh, so there's um, obviously the research component is really important, like your research competence, the amount of projects that you're engaging in, but you also need to demonstrate competence in teaching. Uh, so, you know, in terms of teaching opportunities in the Department of Psychiatry, I would say it's sort of limited because it's geared towards uh, psychiatrists and clinicians. Um, so I had an opportunity to teach a course in the epi department, and that's how I got an appointment as a you know, joint faculty where I was able to teach a course in the spring quarter. Initially co-teaching with Roger Deedles and after he retired, I took on the, the course. So teaching opportunities came about in the Department of Epidemiology. And then that's how I got to know a lot of uh, masters and doctoral students. Um, is there a question? I heard something. Okay, so, so I wanted to just focus on, you know, the front end of my career. And then since then, I was able to engage in, you know, many other projects. And, you know, my advisor, Roger Deedles, who was a pioneer in starting the Fulberty training program in 2014, I was invited to be a co-director for Myanmar and Thailand uh, Fulberty International Training Program. Uh, so, and, and I think back in March of this year, uh, so in July of this year, Mary Jane Rotherham, the center director, retired. And in March of this year, it was a, you know, a, a pro appropriate time for me to uh, move out of the center. So I'm currently in a different center within the same department within um, psychiatry in the Division of Population Behavioral Health. Um, okay, so I think we spent enough time on this busy slide. Um, so yeah, so in terms of my research background, um, I would say the common theme and common thread that holds all my components together is uh, focus on health disparities. So I know that my research primarily focuses on you know, HIV prevention and management, um, but we're talking about a lot of marginalized and vulnerable communities. And when we think about you know, HIV, um, I think it's just beyond the HIV itself. I think a lot of communities um, uh, have multiple comorbid conditions and stressors that impact uh, their overall well-being, whether it's mental health, whether it's substance use, whether it's structural barriers such as uh, being homeless and being having unstable housing. Uh, so, you know, my my research in Asia is still tied to the work that I did in the beginning of my career. Uh, a lot of uh, behavioral interventions. Um, and training and mentoring. I love teaching and mentoring. And I, you know, we have uh, the Thailand and, Thailand and Myanmar forward training program, but I love mentoring like masters and doctoral students in the Department of Epidemiology and Psychiatry. Um, domestically, I was uh, fortunate to be involved in Adolescent Medicine Trials Network. And uh, Jeff is also a key part of that network. Uh, so we engage with vulnerable youth who are living with HIV or at risk for HIV. Um, and then in the, within the new division that I joined, we do a lot of training for providers and staff around providing trauma and resilience informed care for children, families, and adults. Um, so I don't wanna to spend too much time on my current research portfolio, but uh, all I wanna say is that I think, I think it's important to, important to kind of, um, so, this is a good segue to my advice to you about building your research career. And during your introduction, I think it's really remarkable. Um, you know, we have a really good collection of scholars with various research backgrounds and, and goals. Um, I would say as you're starting your career, it's really important to be proactive and be open to reaching out to, um, you know, various opportunities and, um, um, you know, be, be open to learning new ideas, be open to learning new research opportunities. 
but at the same time, it is also very important to be selective. Um, what I mean by that is that, you know, as you're starting out, uh, sometimes you get really excited to be involved in many different projects, which is really great. But, you know, when it comes down to is that uh, sometimes if you're involved in many different projects focusing on many different research areas, it is difficult, especially in the early part of your career to establish yourself as an expert in a specific content area. Um, and that comes in handy as you're, as, as you're building your career. So when I say selective, it means that once you are involved in a research project with a specific content area, I would encourage you to build on from your you know, current project to a bigger project. And, and um, the example that I wanna give you is back in 2004, you know, I was able to work with my mentors on looking at HIV vaccine acceptability using this market research method called conjoint analysis. And that was back in 2004 and we still have, we still do not have the HIV vaccine. So it's the, the work that I did is still relevant. So this conjoint analysis method that I learned back in 2004, I was able to build on from that method and apply it to many other settings such as testing for HIV, you know, PrEP acceptability, uh, HIV testing and, you know, Jeff connected me with his student, Claire, who did like this dual point of care testing for syphilis and HIV in Haiti and Peru. So, so, you know, by kind of leveraging what you know and finding more opportunities to expand the work that you wanted to do, um, I would say, you know, I have a lot of experience conducting market research, consumer preference research, because I was intentional on building from the work that I did before. And incidentally, I think, I think Jeff, you know this um, colleague in University of Arizona, Purnima. So she contacted me recently and we submitted an R21 um, and she wanted to look at uh, COVID-19 vaccine acceptability among African-American and Latino communities in Arizona and Florida. And she wanted to use conjoint analysis and she approached me and you know I collaborated with her and we just submitted the grant. So, so I think in terms of you know securing or uh, finding research opportunities, it is important to be open and proactive, but at the same time, it is also very important to uh, stay the course and be intentional and specific and selective about your research opportunities. Yeah, I just want to I just want to uh, echo that. So, you know, my mentor back in 1995, um, you know, he basically made the key point in, in as a researcher, you want to be known, you know, for one thing, you want to be the world expert on that topic, you know, so if he gets a call, he's the mentor and my mentor was King Holmes and he was a big guy at STD and advised the CDC. And he would get asked all the time, you know, who should we call for this issue? Who should we call for this? So at the time I was kind of the internet and STD guy in the uh, 90s. And, you know, he's like, okay, call Jeff Klausner for anything to do with the internet and, and STDs. So Jay has a similar experience with conjoint analysis. It's this, you know, somewhat unique type of uh, methodology to understand, um, you know, preferences in um, <clears throat> adaptation or uptake of different kinds of interventions. So it's a great example of, you know, Jay had the reputation as the conjoint analysis guy. So someone wants to do some, you know, research on preferences for different interventions, all worlds, you know, lead to Jay. It's obviously not the only thing he does, but he maintains that you know, reputation. So from, you know, early point on, he becomes the guy that people want to collaborate with. And as people do more team science and, you know, this interdisciplinary research, you always need kind of for NIH particularly, you need to build a team of different experts. So it's like when, when you write these grants, particularly larger grants, you need to develop a baseball team. So you need the best third base player. You need the best pitcher. You need the best, you know, manager. You need the best, um, you know, person in right field. So as a researcher, you want to develop that reputation in that really unique area of, you know, methodology, 
or population. So Jay and I often work with people who are, you know, specialists in transgender health or transgender, uh, you know, medicine or transgender prevention. So they provide that like special population expertise. It, it's not all you have to do, uh, but you want to maintain that thread, you know, throughout your career. So you become the, you know, go-to person in that. And that provides you a sustainable source of continued research collaboration. So it excites me to, to no end that, you know, I reached out to Jay to do this work on in, in Haiti, you know, with syphilis and HIV a few years ago now, four or five years ago, actually. But now he's still, you know, being reached out to do, you know, COVID vaccine on co-joint analysis. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And and I think I think you captured captured it really well. So, um, you know, going from uh, developing your career, yeah, it is important to be uh, to be focused and selective. Um, this is kind of a loaded slide, but you know, so this is you know, the caveat is that this is my career trajectory going from assistant professor in residence to a full professor. Um, for for this appointment, there are three broad buckets: uh, research, teaching, and service. And I would say, you know, the advice is that. Um, for the faculty series, I think the first and foremost, they look at your research productivity. Uh, so it's in the form of, you know, the, the amount of number of grants that you bring in, the publications that you have, and, you know, the conference presentations that you make. But at the same time, they also look at, um, you know, they, they're looking at faculty who's well-rounded and independent. So they also look at your teaching record. And, and I mentioned, you know, my joint appointment in epidemiology, and that gave me an opportunity to teach a course every year. And I also engage in a lot of guest lectures in undergrad and uh, nursing school um, and give seminars. And then service is also very important. So I, you know, serve in a lot of, and, and Jeff probably serves on so many more communities than I do, but, uh, you know, it's important to provide service uh, to your institution. So I, you know, um, uh, sit on like data safety monitoring board, uh, academic advancements and appointments committee, uh, executive advisory board committee. And, 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 you know, I think that for an emerging investigator, it is important to have a um, healthy balance in terms of prioritizing these buckets. And I think each of you might have a different bucket or different buckets. Uh, some of you who are uh, clinicians might have to balance your research with your clinical duties um, and your teaching duties. Um, but I think it's important to kind of be, sometimes it's important to kind of pick and choose uh, what you can do and what you cannot do. And it's okay to respectfully decline um, if you think that it's something that it's beyond the scope of what you can provide. Um, but at the same time, it's also important to kind of look back and see your portfolio as a whole. Okay, so what is my current research portfolio? What is my current clinical portfolio or teaching portfolio? What is my service portfolio? And it's important to also kind of engage with your mentors on, you know, your career trajectory to make sure that, you know, you're on the right track. That goes to your mentors. So, um, I would say Jeff is a really great example of a great mentor. I, I, you know, so before I moved my center to a different center, we, we shared an office. His office was right next to mine. And I would always see him come in and then he would see like students like every day. Like, you know, he's so generous and giving. And uh, I, you know, I think that's something that's really, um, you know, inspiring and remarkable. Um, you know, Jeff, you know, you're such a generous uh, giver and mentor. And I think that that speaks volumes. And, and in terms of mentoring, you know, so many, many mentors are very generous and they're very giving. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important to do, you know, your self-assessment and be honest in terms of, okay, so what are some of the training needs that I have and pursue mentors that can fill that training gap. Um, and, and, you know, you should also be open to learning new um, areas. And, um, and I think this goes back to, you know, um, 
being selective in terms of uh, your research opportunities and um, coming up with ways where you can become an expert and securing mentors that can support you so that you can become a content expert is also very important. So make sure that you know, your mentors are fit your research career path. Jay? Uh, yes. Um, sorry, I just wanted to find out about the, the, the buckets you talked about, um, the sure. research, teaching, and service. Mm -hmm. So if you're not yet affiliated with the university and still very much in a research institute, what mm -hmm. would be your advice on trying to get um, uh, to fill in that bucket? Like, apart from teaching at a university, how else would you be able to fulfill that bucket? So that's a really great question. So I think I think you can be. Um, so yeah, one obvious way is to you know hold like a adjunct faculty position in a university institution, so you can provide te teaching or guest lectures. But I think at the same time, so if your career goal is to eventually transition into an academic faculty position. Uh, there are ways to demonstrate your teaching record through uh, other means. So one example might be, you know, leading a workshop um, or, you know, um, leading like a, like a seminar series with uh, community partners that are interested in your work. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily, teaching doesn't necessarily have to be in a classroom setting. Uh, teaching can be done in many different ways. Um, and I think it's important to kind of build your teaching portfolio so that when it comes, when there's an opportunity to apply for a faculty position, you already have a relatively good track record of your teaching. I don't know if that answered your question. Yes, that's helpful. Thank you. Sure. All right. So how much time do we have? We have 15 more minutes. So I want to, you know, leave time for us to have a discussion. So, you know, so this, this is like a classic example, like back in early 2000, I got a career development award. It's a, it's a pretty important and useful award as a young investigator. They give you five years of funding to, you know, uh, become an independent investigator. And the way I uh, form my mentors is very, a good example of, you know, choose the mentors that can fill your training gap. So, the, the research project that accompanied the career development award is I wanted to develop like an intervention for families impacted by HIV in Northeastern Thailand. So, but then, you know, this is an intervention that was done in the US, but it had to be adapted to a Thai setting. So we initially needed to do some formative work, uh, focus groups and in-depth interviews. So, but then I'm an epidemiologist, so I needed training and qualitative data analysis. So I secured a mentor who was an expert in qualitative data or you know, making meaningful analysis on qualitative data. Uh, intervention design, I had mentors who are experts in you know, designing the intervention, behavior intervention. And then once you implement the intervention, you needed uh, support on how do you analyze an intervention with long-term effects? So I had a biostat mentor who helped me, you know, make sense of longitudinal data analysis. So, you know, the mentors that you form is consistent with the training needs that you have. And then by engaging with those mentors, you're able to execute the various research uh, components of your proposed research project. So going from like, you know, qualitative data in the formative phase and then designing the intervention and then implementing the intervention and then analyzing the impact of the efficacy of the intervention. So, so I think that the good thing is for the most part, mentors are really generous and they, they give you good advice. Um, you should be also intentional about, so if you have 10 mentors and all of them are behavioral intervention experts, it's great, but you might need some other mentors who can support you in other uh, training areas. Um, and this is the last, one of the last slides. Uh, in terms of my experience working with um, community partners, I would say it's, so, so I, I also have this problem where, you know, I, my level of enthusiasm sometimes, you know, facilitates me to speak a lot and like share my ideas. 
But at the same time, I think it's important to respect um, your colleagues' culture as well as their values and the norms. And sometimes it's okay to be uncomfortable in the silence moment. So when you when when they don't respond or when they don't share their ideas, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not agreeing with you. Uh, it might mean that they're still processing what you want to do in terms of collaboration. So it's important to kind of take a step back and listen first, and then and then you know after you listen to their ideas and concerns or issues, uh, it's okay to share your thoughts. But um, uh, I learned I learned the hard way, not the hard way, but when we were doing an intervention in in Thailand, one of the intervention modules was addressing mental health in Thailand. So the word mental health, you know, I didn't take it like you know. I thought mental health is mental health, but for Thai culture, and I, I would imagine it's also common in many other cultures, the, the notion of having a mental health issue is still a very stigmatizing uh, concept. Uh, someone who's mentally ill is, there's a fair amount of stigma associated with it. Um, so when we were trying to adapt this uh, intervention module to address mental health, you know, my Thai colleagues were not really responsive so I, I thought, okay, so there's something wrong with this module because they're not, they're being quiet and they're not really engaging. Turns out that they said, yeah, you know, mental health is very stigmatizing. So we can't say it's a module to call, you know, address mental health. So we adapted by listening to their concerns, we adapted it to uh, physical health me, being healthy body, mental health being healthy mind and, you know, uh, and, and then the social aspects, we call it a healthy community. So just simply changing the word from mental health to healthy mind, it was, it was a successful intervention. But if I just went on to impose my, my thinking, okay, so we have to do mental health module, it, it wouldn't have been successful. So I think in terms of community partners, it's really good to take a step back and listen to what they have to offer. So I think in, in terms of, you know, like as a, as a wrap up, I think uh, securing your research opportunities, uh, I would say be proactive, but also be selective uh, and, you know, find ways to build from your research experience to ultimately become a content expert. And it's also good to demonstrate your competence. So competence and productivity in key specific key areas. Uh, in terms of mentoring, I think it's important to be intentional about identifying your mentors that can fill your specific training uh, training gaps. And in terms of partners, community partners, I think it's important to listen first and speak later. And I would say that as a personal note, it's been such a wonderful experience uh, so far. And I've had the fortune of having so many great mentors. And uh, I would say, as you embark on your research career, it's important to, you know, pay it forward. And if you have mentees um, that need your advice, I would be, you know, I would encourage you to be um, supportive and generous. And, and I think um, I would say my work gets elevated because of the work, uh, excellent work that my mentees do. So, uh, so pay it forward is, uh, I would say, it's an important, important lesson. So I think that's all I have. And uh, I was kind of nos nostalgic about pre-COVID. And I have a picture of my family. We went to an international AIDS conference in, in the Netherlands a, a few years ago. Um, and uh, I would like to you know, say, say thank you for your attention and be safe and healthy. And, um, and let me open it up for a question and answer. So feel free to put comments in the chat or uh, speak out or raise your hand. Hi. Hi, Lucy. Uh, so I wanted to find out uh, what you think, the uh, what you see the role of social networking technologies. I know this is not from your talk, but from 
one from some of the work that you did in HIV prevention work, do you see a role of social networking technologies in the current crisis? Yeah, I think, um, and, and Jeff has done a lot of work uh, using social networking technologies. I think it's, it's, a, it's one of the, you know, one of the important tools uh, that we can use um, not only on HIV prevention or treatment, but you know, just uh, addressing health issues as a whole. Uh, I would say you know, social networking strategy is one of the many tools that we can use. But but at the same time, we also have to be mindful of some of the limitations and some of the. So you know, I think the idea is you need to engage with. Um, you know, folks who are content experts and how we can maximize and leverage the current technology, including social network. Um, but at the same time, you know, we, it's, I would say we should use caution. And I think it's, it's important to note that it's a, it's a great, it's a great tool, but it can be misused and it can be a, you know, um, a tool to spread not accurate information or misinformation. And, and I think it, it, it comes, it's relevant in terms of how we manage um, uh, diseases using social networking technology. Uh, so I think it's important to be, um, be focused and, and rely on content experts so that we can maximize the tools. Thank you. So um, open to comments or discussions. Um, Did I lose you guys um, so, along the way? <laughs> um, I, I've got a question. Um, so um, thank you for the interesting um, uh, um, talk about your career and how you've built it. Um, one message that I got is how we need to be intentional and selective about um, what we will become known about. So now I like a lot of variety and I find that excites me. So sometimes I'm feeling like, okay, so if I choose one area, um, I may become bored. I mean, how do you deal with that? Sorry about the little ones. No worries. It's, it's great to see little yeah. ones. I think, I think that's, a, that's a really great question. And it's okay, it's okay to be, I think it's, it's great to be multidisciplinary and it's great to be well-rounded. Um, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I'm discouraging you to be interested in many areas, but at the same time, as Jeff mentioned, it is always good to have a specific um, expertise that you can you can build on, you can keep building on. So I think it's a it's a matter of so you know I think you know my my exposure and expertise in conjoint analysis is a good example, but you know I also do a lot of other other things that are related to just you know broad public health. So I think I think it's just a matter of how you prioritize your time to invest in building your content expertise as well as being involved in other other areas. And it's it's not I would say it's not easy, but it's you know it's doable. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I see some of the comments in the chat box. So if you could give us an advice on how to organize your time with so many responsibilities, especially during the time when you're transitioning from junior to NASA junior researcher. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think it's hard. So prioritizing your time to, to you know, look at each of those buckets and figure out how to build each of those buckets, I think it's challenging. And sometimes as a junior investigator, when you, when you get delegated to do something, it's often difficult to say no. Um, but, but I would say, and this is where, you know, it's important to have great mentors. Because sometimes when you, get, when you get asked to do certain things and you think that it's not, you know, appropriate or it's going to be a case where you're not going to be able to do your other other duties, uh, you should reach out to your primary mentor and kind of seek advice. And sometimes, 
you know, mentors can intervene with other colleagues and say, hey, you know, I know that you asked Jay to do this analysis, but you know, he's working on this, this important you know, manuscript that, that I'm working together. So this has to wait. Um, and, and they can act as a buffer to make sure that you can kind of you know, build your research career. Um, but it, it's, it's difficult. Uh, and especially when you're a junior investigator, you, know, you, wanna, you wanna embrace all the opportunities that you get because you know, sometimes you feel like you can't really pick and choose. You just have to get into all the opportunities that you have. But sometimes it's important to be honest and say, okay, so you know, I've been asked to do this, but I can't, I can't really provide. And it's not doing them justice because you, you can't provide it in an adequate manner. Uh, so let me see, Frank had a comment. Uh, so looking out for faculty positions, we end up trying to get as many publications as possible by connecting and working with multiple research groups. It's not very clear how to be cautious about this kind of approach. So yeah, that's a good point. So we have a lot of postdoctoral fellows um, that, that work with, our, with, with Jeff and myself. Uh, and their approach is, uh, you know, postdoctoral fellowship is two years. And within those two years, you want to get as many publications as possible, uh, which is one strategy. But if you have like say 10 publications, you know, within the two year period, I think the amount of publications is good. But when you are up for um, say a tenure track assistant professor position, they look at the 10 publications and if 10 publications are from 10 different research areas it is sort of difficult to kind of get a sense of who this candidate is. So while it is important to engage in opportunities where you have publication opportunities, it's also important to have, you know, focused um, publication track where you are either the first author, where you are instrumental in coming up with the research design and concept and the paper concept and executing it throughout. Uh, so I think it's it's important. Um, okay, so uh, it's uh, two minutes past eight thirty, so it's time to end. But you know, it's it's been a pleasure uh, interacting with you, albeit virtually. Um, Jeff put my email address in the chat box, so feel free to reach out and I'd be happy to, you know, we can also schedule a one-on-one -on -one Zoom session if you, uh, if you want, so I'm open to that. So thank you. All right, thanks everybody. All right, be safe, be kind. Uh, we'll see you again soon, take care. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.